Well, I want to welcome you back this Sunday morning. Welcome online, Jasper County Jail Campus, DeMont Wheatfield. What a week it's been. Lots of cool stuff happening. Um, we actually have John Graham, our new youth director, who has started this last week, and he's been doing great. He taught at our Next Gens, and he is not Zachary's replacement. He's Zachary's successor, because how can you replace Zachary? But uh, I am excited to say Zachary has received and accepted a call to be the senior pastor of uh, Christ Family Church in Davenport, Iowa. So let's give him a big round of applause. Well-deserved. We're happy for him, and, uh, you know, John Graham is going to be a worthy successor. He's going to do a great job. Him and his wife, Kylie, are at this location today. They'll be at Hebron next week, but uh, if you do get a chance, make sure to say hi to him. Uh, he looks just like John Graham, so uh, <laughs> he's around. He's out there, but uh, what a week it was. Sisterhood, you guys, was amazing. I mean, it was a really, really great night. To me, it was ministry perfection. I mean, it was so good. Trace Amigos had this huge fundraiser that uh, we didn't know about for um, the schools, and they filled half the parking lot up there. And I, I get there, and I'm like, the parking lot's full. Like, what in the world? How is this happening? We ended up filling up the other two-thirds of the parking lot, and if you can do math, that means we were over full. I mean, you ladies were parking everywhere. Double parking people at Ace Hardware, absolutely, in the snowdrifts, no problem. I mean, we just, and uh, we actually made the Hebron Chatter page, which doesn't take much, but uh, what I love is um, Hebron defended us. You know, there are people, lots of people who didn't go to our church who are like, listen, Karen, if you're complaining about a uh, full parking lot in our town, you better stop. And it's cool to see our church at any location have a reputation for being a fountain of life in our community and to see people who don't go here recognize that this is a good thing. And I'm just proud of you guys for making this church love Jesus with our actions, not just our words. And uh, that night we saw over 80 women sign up to be a deeper part of our community um, through life groups, the Worship was electric. The room was absolutely full. And uh, I just, I don't think we could have had 15 more women show up. Like, I wish that you would have come if you didn't come, but if 15 more of you came, it would have, you know, it would have been too many. So that was pretty sweet. But the thing I liked the most was the presence of God. Like, it was just very clear um, that the Lord was there. And uh, for an hour on Monday night, I think it was great not to worry about snow days and child care or global tensions and politics. Um, we weren't worried about our marriages or our kids being crazy. We were focused on the presence, the power, and the purpose of Jesus Christ for our lives. And uh, it was a great night. And uh, for many years, uh, my wife has volunteered to champion sisterhood along with Nina Colcott. I actually call her Nina Chichenina. And uh, she... Um, She's, she's been great. They've been great. But uh, behind closed doors, I kind of whine about it a lot because I'm here and I need attention. You know, when Kristen's always working on sisterhood, I'm like, I'm here, you know. And uh, the other night, we had a group of 20 ladies at our house getting ready for sisterhood, doing things that sisters do. I don't know, like crafts and whatever stuff that boys would find dumb. But they're doing this, and it's like the third time we've had 20 ladies at our house getting ready for sisterhood, and I'm just mopey and whatever, and they just start sharing about how God has used that ministry through this church to change their eternities and to transform their marriages. And it was really humbling to sit back and realize how God has used a bunch of ladies with a heart for the gospel in our community. And I'm just thankful for the 60 or so women who have helped lead and put that program on. I'm just, I'm so proud proud of you guys. And it's just normal women with kids and lives who say, here I am, Lord. Yeah, here I am, Lord. Use me. And that's our whole church. That's a story of this church. It's a bunch of people. It's not a pastor. It's not a staff. It is a group of people who love Jesus together, saying, I'm going to step out of my comfort zone. Here I am, Lord. Use me, whatever it is, like our production, all the stuff, our band. I mean, everything is just people saying, here I am, Lord. Use me. And I'm, I'm so thankful for you guys. But uh, that brings up the question for a lot of you, um, what about the brothers? Pastor, what about the brothers? We need some brotherhood up in here. And I'm telling you, Brotherhood 2.0 is coming, but here's the thing. My wife works for me at the church, okay? Um, she is volunteer. She doesn't get paid, but I am her boss, and I did give her the assignment months ago to select a night for brotherhood. You know, you got to coordinate it with things and reasons and make sure there isn't like some sort of Trace Amigo school fundraiser the same night, like we missed that one. But we try to coordinate with everybody and communicate and whatever and whatever else. And she still has not selected a date for Brotherhood 2. So Kristen, if anybody sees you, I hope they remind you to select a date for brotherhood. This is me doing it, because I know that on Valentine's Day, one of the best things you can do is call out your wife in front of the whole church. So that's what I'm doing. Love you. We still married? Hopefully. Okay. Um, 
But this is a special week. We're calling this The Greatest Adventure. And uh, I'm actually really excited about this message and this weekend. I told the staff, like, hey, let's do something special for Valentine's Day. Let's help some brothers out because that way they can be like, honey, I took you already to church on Valentine's Day. You know, the day um, before the day of disappointment for most women is what we call it in my house. But um, anyway, uh, I'm pumped about this message. And uh, I want to start this message off with a clip from a movie called Up. And this is why in-person church attendance matters. Because online, you ain't going to get the clip. What you're going to get is a talking head of me trying to explain what's happening in this clip. Because Mark Zuckerberg and Meta slash Facebook won't let us play anything, even though we have licenses for it. Because their algorithms are just super sensitive. So anyway... I'm excited for you to see this clip from Disney Pixar's The Movie Up to start this message off. Go ahead and play it. Hey, online church. Thank you so much for joining us this weekend. And right now, in all of our auditoriums, we are playing my favorite clip from The Movie Up. And if you haven't seen it, it's this incredible, incredible movie about an old widowed widower um, named Carl and him learning how to move on in life after his wife has passed away. But the montage I'm showing um, displays Carl's life with his wife, Ellie. And they have this beautiful romance, this beautiful marriage where they're each other's one and only, and they just love life together. And Ellie always had this dream of going on a great adventure. She wanted to go to see this big old waterfall in South America. And uh, they never got to do it together. They would save their pennies, they tried to be able to do it, but they couldn't do it. And they were so cute together as a couple, but things kept happening where they couldn't go on their great adventure together. But nevertheless, their love is picture perfect. They have this great romance. Oh, I forgot to mention, she's also infertile. And um, part of the movie portrays their struggle with fertility. But nevertheless, they get over all these different obstacles in their relationship. And the movie portrays their love is just perfect. Like, oh man, it's so cute, it's amazing. Uh, but then sadly, she dies. And uh, she's running up the hill, and Carl decides that he is going to pay to take them on this great adventure to South America. You know, they're clearly getting older. They're in their 70s or 80s. And um, right before he gives her the tickets, he's like bringing her on this picnic to this tree that they used to hang out under when they were younger. Um, as she's running up the hill, she has a heart attack, and she passes away. And it's so sad, and everybody's sad. And then at the very, very end, um, it shows Carl at her funeral. And sadly, even though they had this beautiful romance with each other that pulls you in and is super captivating, um, nobody comes to the funeral. It's just him and her. They were truly each other's one and only. And the rest of the mo movie shows Carl being truly alone. And it's so sad. I wish I could show you the clip, but we can't show it online because we don't have a license for it and we'll get taken down. And even if we do have a license for it, um, many of our streaming platforms would just take us down anyway because that's just it's what they do. Um, but uh, I'm so glad that you're joining us online. I would encourage you to consider coming in person at either of our in-person locations. I think that one of the key parts about church is gathering together and being known by people. And I'm so glad you're joining online, but uh, I'm grateful that the coronavirus pandemic is basically over. And uh, church is a safe and amazing place to be. And I wanna encourage you to come in person. But thanks for joining us online. Love you guys very much. We're gonna go back to a countdown. And once that countdown is over, you'll come back into our live services. I'll See you soon. That movie came out the year that Kristen and I got engaged, and uh, I hadn't watched it since then, 13 years ago. And I mean, I was gasping for air in my office when I rewatched it for the first time in like a decade. And uh, so much of that pierces our hearts, doesn't it? I mean, the way they loved each other and brought out the best in each other, the way they just enjoyed one another, their contentment was something that was inspiring. And I think watching their struggle with infertility is something that, especially in my generation, really strikes home for us. Infertility levels are rising exponentially, and watching them pivot from trouble to trouble with poise and satisfaction was life-giving. I think one of the scenes I really enjoyed was when they saw each other in the window, you know, at old age, and yet they still had that spark the way they seemed to effortlessly compliment one another with their different personalities. They were childhood sweethearts. We had to cut that part out, but they were each other's one and only beginning from childhood. And I think the thing that really cuts us is the last clip. They were each other's one and only, so much so that nobody came to Ellie's funeral. And he just sits there alone, broken and empty. Everybody wants a marriage, a friendship, a relationship, a person, just like that. Even if it's just platonic, we all want our somebody, our person. Why? 
I think it's because our society almost idolizes romance. We idolize marriage. We somehow think that we can find this person, this ideal that is going to bring us satisfaction. And we also don't think about the end of the story. I mean, we act like Ellie dying is this huge surprise. Guess what? I'm pretty sure the death rate continues to hover right around 100% for us. I mean, she was always going to die. All marriages end in divorce or death. In fact, I think that's the moral of the entire movie up, isn't it? They loved each other so much that they never learned to love anyone else. And they have this beautiful montage that pulls us in and it makes us want it so much, but it ends with this broken man at a funeral for his beloved wife that no one else came to. And the rest of the movie is about them rectifying, Carl rectifying that mistake by learning to love others. They had this wonderful marriage that they selfishly kept from everyone. Because even if there is just one person that you feel safe around, that you enjoy so much, and you complete them, and whatever else, and you feel perfectly contented with, God made you for more than that. He made you for a great adventure. And I don't want the end of our stories to be us weeping at our spouse's funeral. The end of our story is standing before Jesus. You see, marriage seems like this big, huge commitment, but really it isn't. Something doesn't come from nothing. Intelligent design doesn't come from no intelligence. We know 100% that eternity is real. We know, for sure. We know from archaeology, biology, history, and sociology quite clearly that the events recorded in the Bible really did happen. And even if you're a skeptic, you have to admit that among all the world religions, including the religion of atheism, the track record of Christianity is uniquely and singularly vindicated. And what that means for us is kind of a big deal. It means that if eternity is real, then this life is just an eye blink before eternity. I love the way that James, the half-brother of Jesus, puts it. He says, how do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, and then it's gone. Like if eternity is real, which all the evidence would indicate that it in fact is, this life then is so short. I mean, marriage is just an eye blink. This life is just a mist. I love what Jesus has to say about marriage and life to the religious leaders. He, it says, Jesus replied, your mistake is that you don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. For when the dead are raised, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. In this respect, they will be like the angels in heaven. In other words, we're not going to be married in heaven. And some of you are like, praise Jesus, I'm so glad I came to church today. Okay, I didn't mean to do devil horns in church, but some of you are saddened by that. But Jesus is leaning into my big point today, and I really want you to get this, okay? Lean into this big point. Um, marriage is not the biggest deal in your life. Relationships, love, dating, romance, friends, kids, grandkids, they're not the biggest deal. You're not going to find ultimate contentment in those things alone. What they do is they support the biggest deal, which is to honor God with our lives. I will not stand before God next to my wife, Kristen. I will stand before God on my own. And that means that marriage is to prepare us for eternity. Heaven, and this is the problem. I think so many of us think heaven is like an extension of this life. It's like, you know, this life plus. This life, you know, without stubbing your toe and morning breath. This life without pain and sickness and sadness. But God tells us that heaven is not a version of this life. It's a whole other level. It's a whole different dimension. It's something that's universally and infinitely, totally and completely better when you read the descriptions of heaven in the Bible, like they don't have the words because it is so much different and better. I love the way Paul puts it. He says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. This life is just an eye blink of preparation for that infinitely better, infinitely different future. And I want to spend the rest of this message talking about how we can make the most of our marriages and relationships and friendships in light of eternity. And even if you're not a Christian, I do think that you're going to find these thoughts refreshing and helpful and life-giving. I've just got a few points that I want to make. And my first one's really simple. I believe that no marriage is satisfying in and of itself. And uh, from the outside, it looks like Kristen and I have a good marriage. And we do. I mean, we are super compatible. How satisfying is it for her to come home to all this right here? You know what I mean? Like, come on. Like, of course. Of course. She feels great. But for real, um, when I saw that montage in the movie Up, like, that is mine and Christian's relationship apart from Jesus. Like, we love each other. We get along. If we didn't follow Jesus, that would be us. And we do have the best marriage. And Kristen had me say this because, you know, I oftentimes make fun of myself. But she's like, you know, John, you need to tell them that you really are a good husband. And I am. We're compatible on a lot of levels. I love leading. 
I, uh, I love bringing people with me, and, and, and she loves following. She wanted a man who would be a big, strong man who would take care of her and cast vision and support her, and uh, we're, we fit together really well. We have the same interests. We have the same sense of humor. We have the same five love languages in the exact same order with the same scores. I mean, we love each other completely, easily, and naturally. I could spend days with her. But honestly, our marriage is not satisfying in and of itself. And I remember we thought it would be. When we first got married, married, Kristen felt a little sad and a little empty. And she got what she'd always wanted, which was the man of her dreams. But despite our compatibility, despite the joy we took in one another, the problem wasn't me, it wasn't her, it was deeper than that, but deep in her heart, she felt lonely. And she got what she wanted as a little girl, but as a big girl, she realized it didn't bring her contentment. Now, I loved her completely. I mean, she was the apple of my eye. Shortly after our wedding day, I had a very painful surgery with a truly horrendous recovery, and I won't tell you about it because I don't want everybody to vomit here, but... Um, I was in the hospital recovering from full anesthesia, and I've had lots of surgeries, and I always tell my anesthesiologist, I say, don't use ketamine on me because it makes me high as a kite. Like, I react really poorly. Please don't. Well, my anesthesiology didn't listen, and uh, they used ketamine, and I was, I mean, I was super high, like, like out of my mind. I do not remember any of it, but I know that I always make a ruckus when they use that drug, right? So um, they get Chris in out of the waiting room. They're like, you need to come to the recovery hall. And apparently I am in there just literally singing and shouting at the top of my lungs how beautiful my wife is. Like all I am, just talking about how beautiful she is, how enthralled with her I am, how much I love her, how I can't wait to see her, and how contented I am with her, and how I can't wait to get home. And that was probably the worst part. Won't go into details there. But it was, it was real, you know? And uh, here's the thing, here's the thing. That's how much I loved her. When I was high out of my mind, my wife was a woman of my dreams, and that's it. She's all I wanted to talk about. Like I did, I loved her completely. But it was never enough for her. She just thought if I could have more of him, if he just you know, wouldn't go to work as much, if he just whatever, but it was never enough. One night, after we'd been married for six months, I went out for the first time in our marriage without her. Right, I mean, I always just stuck around with her, whatever, but I wanted to go see my best friend from high school. Right, and uh, she was like, babe, go have fun without me, no problem, just go ahead, like, I don't mind, I want you to have fun, whatever. And I missed all the signs, but anybody who's been married for a while knows that that's a trap. Like, don't do it, don't do it, you know, she's lying, she doesn't want you to, she wants you to choose her over him. So I get there, and she is just blowing up my phone, you know, all the time, like calling, and it's like, finally I answer, and I know better than act like I'm having a good time. You know, I'm like, everybody shut up, stop laughing, run into a different room, you know, turn down the music, like, no, it's just terrible, we're not having any fun, like, da 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 no, I hate it, I don't have fun without you, but it was never enough. And I think I just thought, you know, if I loved her more, then I'd feel good, and she'd feel good, and from the outside, we had a good marriage, and from the inside, we did, we had a good marriage. But marriage in and of itself is not fulfilling. Even if your relationship is perfect, there is a fundamental need that all humans have that is not met in marriage. And here's why. Here's why. God made marriage as a part of a greater adventure. I kept thinking of Jesus' words to the religious people of his day. What does he say? He says, for when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. And I think that Christians and society have made such an idol out of marriage, out of romance, out of relationships we keep thinking, if you just find your person, if you just find your person, it's going to whatever. Listen, finding that person is not the highest priority. It's not. It is a tool to get you closer to what matters most. Kids, relationships, grandkids, marriage, it's not going to satisfy. Jesus satisfies. And I believe that marriage can be a part of serving God, but marriage is not God. And I think Christian society needs to take a good, long, hard look in the mirror and reprioritize. Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount, I think, are really telling. He says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasure in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. And you know, I realize when I hear that passage, of course, I'm not satisfied in my relationship with Kristen. We have everything that we've ever wanted, but this life is fleeting. And the problem is when this life is finite, nothing in this life will ever be enough. It'll never be enough. You'll always sit there and want just a little bit more. If I just had a little bit more of them, if I just had a little bit more, but there's never more. James 4.14 reminds us, our life is like the morning fog. It's here for a little while and then it's gone. Let me put it this way. The point of basketball at higher levels is not to be best friends with your teammates. That might be a tertiary side effect of playing on the team, but the point of basketball at competitive levels is to win games. The friendships happen as you're going on the great adventure. The point of marriage isn't to find contentment in the marriage. The point of marriage is to win at life. 
It's to play a great adventure together. The deepest bonds in life, according to sociologists, um, are foxhole buddies. People in foxholes together. And what's crazy about that is that you are on this great adventure together, and you can take two completely incompatible people, a brother from Chicago and a redneck from down south, and they are best friends for life. Why? Because they are on a great adventure together. Same thing is true for teammates on a deeply dedicated team. The same thing is true for coworkers at a purpose-driven company. The same thing is true for a couple in a marriage when they have a great adventure together. You might have a low level of compatibility, but it does not matter. Because when you have this goal that you're striving for together, this greater adventure, it will enrich your relationship greatly. And the problem with the relationship in the beginning of the Up movie, and the problem with Kristen and me early in our marriage, is that we had no great adventure. We both believed in Jesus. I was the pastor at a church, but together, we just wanted to complete each other. In the movie Up, Carl, the husband, ends up truly empty and miserable. He ends up empty and without purpose. At the end of his life, he feels he's accomplished nothing. And rather than looking back with pride and joy at what had been done and the legacy that had been built, he looked back with yearning and emptiness for what had been. And this was not what God made us for. And I don't want that to be the end of my story. I don't want that to be the end of your story. In my marriage, we were just trying to complete each other. And that ends badly, almost always. And usually the outcome is you just give up and lower your expectations, isn't it? I mean, so many of us, we're in that kind of mood. Well, I wish it was gonna, but I mean, I guess it is what it is. You know, some of us, that's what we're in. We're in the it is what it is marriage. It is what it is. You know, he's not what I want. He's not what I thought of you. She's not whatever. Um, or you just quit and you get divorced. Or you break up or you ghost or you get new friends or whatever. Or you live for each other and you end up heartbroken like Carl. And I looked at all these outcomes and I thought, that is not the end of the story that I want. I feel like God made us for more, better, and different. You see, I believe that we need to find a great adventure. And right around this point in our marriage, I started a class in seminary um, about sharing your love for Jesus with others. And I asked my wife to take this class with me. I said, I think we're going to enjoy this together. I just had a premonition. And I remember the professor's name was Dr. Wheeler at Liberty University. And uh, we watched his lectures and Dr. Wheeler started talking about eternity and Jesus being the only way. He said, do you really believe it? Like, do you really believe that Jesus is the only way, the only hope for humanity? And he told the usual stories that professors do in classes like this. He said, um, what would you do to save your child from an illness that they're dying from? Like, imagine your son or daughter, they're dying, they're dying from an illness. It's treatable, good news. But they need medicine to live. If they don't get that medicine, they die. It's that simple. Good news, while the medicine's expensive because of insurance, it's widely available and affordable at, you know, your local pharmacy, at Valley Pharmacy. You just go there. And as long as they get it, your kid's going to live. Might not taste good, but if they get that medicine, they're going to live. You wouldn't be like, uh, the bachelor's on, and um, I really like that show, and I just, you know, the outcome is always so different. You know what I mean? Like, what's going to happen, you know? And when they have the deal, and remember that one time that he ended up choosing the different girl and the whatever, and... Let's watch reruns of Friends, too, because I love Friends, and that's a truly dumpster fire, awful, trashy show, but let's just watch that. Let's watch Fuller House, too. I want to binge that on Netflix, because I love watching Fuller House, because I never liked the Olsen twins, because remember that, and she was just, that Michelle was the worst, because kids are the worst, but I love the older ones and whatever, and let's just play together. You know, I just like playing Legos with my son, and I don't want him to have to taste some weird medicine. No. You would get in your mom car, and you would burn rubber in your Equinox, blowing the time on belts to get to Valley Pharmacy to get that medicine. You would get in your, your uh, Honda Odyssey or your Toyota Sienna or your Prius or whatever it is that you drive, and you would burn rubber to get there. You'd pass all the Mustangs and everybody else. Like, I got a place to go. Nothing worse than getting passed by a Prius in life. But you would get the medicine, and then you would be like, in your face, you take it, son. You eat the medicine. I don't care how it tastes. And then he was like, regardless of your understanding of God's sovereignty, we know that Jesus is the cure for sin. So even if you're not a Christian, one would wonder, if we really believe as Christians what we believe, why are we not living this great adventure, rescuing people, saving lives all the time? Like, what's wrong with us? And that lecture changed their marriage. We saw that this was God's calling on our life. This was our great adventure. And up to that point, we were a couple. But in that moment, we became a couple and a team here to accomplish this great, meaningful goal. And our whole life was reoriented around this great adventure. Up to that point, we didn't really have people over. Kristen was an introvert. I was an introvert. 
I never met with people outside my job. It was just her and I reading books together, whatever. I mean, we read the whole Harry Potter series out loud to one another after having read it multiple times on our own. We had a Harry Potter-themed wedding. I named my daughter Hermione. I mean, there was a lot of stuff that happened. But um, in that moment, we were united. We wanted to build a legacy of transformation. And this was the real thing we thought about. We thought, what do we want our funerals to look like? I don't want people at my funeral to be like, oh, yeah, he was the great father and husband. He loved his kids really well. He just loved his wife so much. Oh, she was a great mom and a great wife. She just, I said, I don't want that to be my epitaph. I want to build a legacy that's bigger than that. I want to store up treasure in heaven. I want people to testify the power of God through our lives, in their lives. That's what I want my memorial service to be like. And that moment changed the way that we live our lives. We have people over for dinner all the time now. Not just to hang out, but to invest in spiritually, like three to seven times a week. That's our goal. And it's not just to hang out. When you are on an adventure, there's none of that insecurity, like, did they, did they like us? Was, was that fun? You know, I mean, that's so much of life before. It's like, I, I don't know what to do here. Like, I'm here at this event. Do I like this? Is this fun? Have you ever been there, and you're, at, like, at a party, and you're sitting there, and you're kind of insecure, and you're like, I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do with my um, feelings and, and funness and whatever. And there's no more insecurity. When you're on the great adventure, you know the score. You know what you're going for. You have a plan. Like, it opens up your mind to the question, are you winning? You know, and you're no longer concerned about, was this fun or whatever. It's, it's, are we winning and are we effective for this great adventure that we're on? And because of the great adventure in, in, in my marriage, Kristen and I have experienced deeper relationships than ever before. Like it's opened up our life and our marriage. We don't have, that did not go, we don't have an open marriage. It's opened up our marriage. It's opened up, let's see, we're using another service. But it's opened up our marriage to much deeper friendships and connections than we've ever imagined otherwise. The great adventure needs to be bigger than this life. It means that we leave a legacy long after we're gone. Even if you're not a Christian, you need to think of a great adventure that's bigger than this life. It can't just be a vacation. You know, I think one of the most telling parts of the Up movie is um, Ellie always wanted to go to Paradise Falls. You saw that jar they were saving to go to this waterfall, and they wanted, she put a painting above their fireplace of their house there. And through a strange series of events in the movie, um, after she's gone, Carl actually does get the house to Paradise Falls. He gets it there. And what's so interesting is he sees it there in the fog, and it just means nothing to him. Because it was a dumb, great adventure. Like it was a worthless, great adventure. And there's so many of us in life, we have these things, and this is what, and this is gonna, and whatever, and we get there, and it means nothing, right? Because a great adventure isn't just some finite vacation, or grandkids, or kids, or a pole barn full of toys, or whatever. It has to give future generations meaning, and hope, and purpose, and contentment. It has to leave a legacy that is a scion of hope in all things. And as someone who is spiritual, I am a spiritual man, I think the best legacies also need to echo in eternity. For me, it is Jesus Christ and the gospel of hope that he brings. In death and life, in tragedy and good times, Jesus is the great adventure that wakes me up with purpose and hope because I can store up treasure in heaven by bringing people with us to something that is infinitely better than anything we can think of, ask for, or imagine. So today, I want to ask you this question, and I want you to lean into this. Regardless of your spiritual beliefs, lean into this. Don't miss the adventure. That's the heartbreaking thing about the movie up. That's a heartbreaking thing about so many of us in our lives today, is we never live the great adventure. We wake up as children with these great dreams and these great ambitions. And how many of us are missing it? We just got sidetracked. Do you remember when you were young in the faith? Do you remember when you were young spiritually and you were in youth group or you were in, I'm gonna do great things. I'm gonna go to the ends of the earth. I'm gonna be a missionary. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna tell everybody and I'm gonna do all this stuff and God's gonna work through me and these big imaginations. And then we just get sidetracked, don't we? We get sidetracked with travel teams and camping trips and lake homes and boats and pole barns and vacations and politics and all this different stuff. And it's like, look, none of that matters. Like, what is the great adventure you're really living for? And the lie we believe is that there is something in this life that's going to complete us. It's a marriage. It's a kid. It's whatever. And the truth is only Jesus can do that. At best, a marriage. At best, the things of this world can show us a more complete picture of Jesus and his love for us. And I think that there are so many, and it is outrageous and contagious what's happening in our church and in our communities with Christians. I think so many of us have just gotten this risk mitigation mindset. How can I just be safe? What can I do to protect? What can I, and like God didn't make you to worry about losing. 
He didn't make you to sit here and da 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 We have infinite eternal life because of the work of Jesus on the cross. We can do great things knowing that God has more in store for us, no matter what. In Christ Jesus, there really isn't any more bad news. Like God can redeem all of it and use it for our good and his glory. And I want us to start living like that again. I want us to really start thinking about the great adventure that we're living for. As I said, the movie Up has been a big deal for Kristen um, and, and, and my marriage. And um, every year, Kristen makes me a drawing, like she does a drawing for our anniversary. This year, though, I got an IOU and um, still waiting on it. But I have all my pictures in my office. You can go and see them. I've got a couple at home as well. But early in our marriage, she made me this picture. It says, you are my greatest adventure. And that was emblematic of that stage in our marriage. We really thought that we were going to find completion in each other. Well, we just loved each other so much and whatever. And we kind of ignored, like, you know, the fact that even when we love each other perfectly, there's still a satisfaction that only comes from Christ. And we were at that stage in our marriage, and we were really, like, looking to and rooted our identity in each other. And we just loved holding each other and all that and whatever. And we still, I still love them. But anyway, um, we were there, and it wasn't right. A few years later, we had taken that class together and we had gone on the great adventure together and God had changed our priorities. And she gave me this picture right here. It says, loyal to the finish. And it's just a reminder that this marriage will end in death. And we're not living for this life. We're preparing each other for the next. We want both of us to finish well for Christ and his kingdom. And we're gonna live together and one of us is gonna die and then the other of us are gonna die and we are gonna stand before Jesus and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. We are living for that. And I'll tell you what, the great adventure has been so good for us. Our marriage is better than ever. We spend less time together. We are more stressed than ever. We have more responsibility than ever before. I mean, she runs the Hebron campus. I run the Wheatfield campus. And I mean, it is, well, I actually don't run the, at least runs the Wheatfield campus. I run, I run both, okay? Actually, I just do nothing but write sermons in my office, okay? I don't know. What do you do during the week, Pastor? Nothing. You know, eat bonbons. But anyway, we're closer than ever because we are living this great adventure together. And I know a lot of you came to this service hoping like, well, maybe pastor's going to fix my marriage. He's going to give me some words of hope on Valentine's Day, and he's going to come in and tell my wife to, you know, um, have some romance with me, hopefully please Jesus, or whatever, whatever you're looking for. But for people looking for love, I want to remind you that Jesus Christ is the only thing that satisfies. And there is a contentment that comes only from him that is greater than anything we could ask for or imagine in this life. And I want to call our church back to that. I just think the last, you know, two years have been put Christians into this priority-changing psychosis. And I want to call us out of this, out of it and remind us that Jesus Christ is the greatest adventure. And he is what is worth living for. And I'm hoping that maybe today, as we head home and we contemplate what was talked about in this message, we won't just be like, well, that was really cool. That church does lots of cool stuff. I would hope we would reprioritize and say, as for me and my house, we are living a great adventure that matters and that will outlast this life. And you know what? It's easy to get sidetracked on all this stuff and the camping and the side-by-sides and the fun and the, and the boats and the cabins and the sports and everything else. But I want us to live for what matters most. So if you're looking for love, if you're looking for that secret spark, I've got three questions for you. Number one, are you living the great adventure? Are you living a great adventure in your life? Symptoms you are not would be living a life that will amount to nothing in eternity and a little legacy in this life. You might feel fine, but when there is a nagging emptiness that leaves you craving for more in all things at all times, I just want a little bit more, I just need a little bit more, one more deer, one more fishing trip. Coming after the guys. What are, what are girls like? One more episode of Friends. I don't know, I'm terrible, I'm a man. Listen, God made you for more. Are you living a great adventure? Um, next question, this is a big one. What is your great adventure? Can you define it? Do you even know what it is? Kristen and I, when um, I first watched that class and, and took the class and did all the stuff, I sat down with her and I said, I want to define what our great adventure is. And we just, we made this statement that has become a statement for our church, but it was generation after generation becoming fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. I just thought, man, if five, seven, ten generations from now in my family, all of my descendants were loving Jesus and their friends and their families and their communities were hearing the gospel of Jesus as a fountain of life through my family, that's a great adventure that I want to go on. 
I want to I want to build this legacy of the gospel of Jesus Christ in my family. That's treasure in heaven. That's what we want. That's how we define the win. If you don't know what that is, if you don't know what your great adventure is, find one this week. What do you want it to be? Sit down and actually think about it, you know? If you're a girl, you can journal about it. If you're a guy, some guys journal. Most guys just think because we don't write with our hands or whatever. But, like, think about it. Don't waste your life. This life is so short. Third thing, this is a big one. Um, what do you have to change to live a great adventure this week? And I just hope that maybe this Valentine's Day, we would go home and we would look at our spouse and say, honey, I want us to live for more. I want us to go on a great adventure. Will you come with me? I can think of nothing more romantic than looking at my wife and saying, honey, I want you to come on a great adventure. Here's a vision for life, and I want you to come with me. Let's bring purpose to everything. She'd be like, boy, say it again. Be like, I will. That's what it is. So many of us are just waiting for the adventure. And one thing that I want to say is we look at these three questions. It's never too late. This is what I love about the movie Up. Carl is a widower octogenarian at the end of his life who finds hope, meaning, and purpose as he begins for the first time to see beyond his own self-enjoyment. I don't care if you're 80 plus. If you're not dead, then God's not done. If you're single at 37, you're divorced three times, you're happily married, you're unhappily married, live the great adventure. God made you to be a conduit of his love to this world. He made you to store up treasure in heaven and do great things, and I want to call you to that. For me, the greatest adventure is living for Jesus Christ and seeing generation after generation become fully devoted followers of Jesus. And it's brought so much joy to my life, and I just want to invite you to come back to it. And you got your connect cards, and if some of you are like, Pastor, I want to live a great adventure, and like, if I'm honest, I don't even know where to begin, you can check a box saying, I've taken some steps with Jesus today, and I'd like some more help in doing it. It's just a top box in the back of your card. And we would love to pray with you this week. You can turn it in at the, um, at, in the usher buckets on your way out. But for all of us, Valentine's weekend, 2022, I want this to be the weekend that we come back to God's purposes and God's adventure for our lives. As we close, I'd like to ask you to stand to your feet. And uh, I'd like to have a prayer at all of our locations. Let's pray together. God in heaven, I thank you for our churches. I thank you for each person that you brought to our services. And today, as we come out of a super dark time in our world and nation's history, I ask that you would reignite a willingness to do great things, daring things, adventurous things for your kingdom and for your glory. Lord, help us to seek and find our contentment in you and your purposes for our life. I ask that you would give marriages, relationships, people, individuals, children, grandparents, visions, for your great purpose and call on our lives. And I ask that you would make today a pivotal day in people's lives as we choose to live a great adventure for your glory and for your name's sake in our lives. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen and amen. Let's sing this last song together.